welcome everyone to this webinar. And as you know, um, this is a webinar of the Elixir 3D Bioinfo community. And today's topic is the new era of structural abundance and what it means in terms of gaining insight into the function of proteins. Um, and, and as you heard from Gonzalo, we have two experts in the field of protein function annotations. Our first speaker today is Dr. Joana Pereira from the University of Basel. She studied biochemistry at the University of Porto and then moved to Amble Hamburg where she worked on method development to improve uh, protein model building using crystallographic data. Uh, she developed a tool called DeepCheck for uh, protein backbone validation. Currently, she works in the team of Professor Torsten Schwede at the Biocentrum in Basel, where she leads her own uh, line of research uh, on the development and deployment of large-scale approaches to functional characterizations of proteins across the entire protein universe. And so her uh, presentation today is titled Uncovering New Families and Folds in the Natural Protein Universe. Over to you, Joanna. Thank you very much for the kind introduction and thank you for the invitation. It's uh, my pleasure to tell you a bit about our most recent work. Uh, and uh, the title of my talk is actually the title of the paper, which was recently published. So the motivation behind this, this work is that when we look at protein databases, and especially the Uniprot, uh, there's actually a lot of protein coding sequences that are known and that are the result of sequencing over 500,000 um, uh, organisms. And when we look at how these proteins are annotated, or at least the titles that are given to them, at least about 20% uh, are named uncharacterized or hypothetical protein, protein of a non-function, or they are annotated with the mains of a non-function. And this is a general picture, but if we break it down into different proteomes, uh, this is quite biased. So there's much more that we know about the human proteome, uh, with, for example, 7% uh, of such human proteins um, being uh, having such titles. Uh, or in pathogens, but if we go, for example, to the environment, uh, there's a much higher number of proteins uh, that remain unannotated. And so uh, the main question that I'm most interested in is how can we, in a more efficient way, shed light into what these proteins are? Are they representing novel protein families that were never uh, characterized or described? or they are just remote homologs of protein families that are already annotated, but um, just uh, they are just outside of the uh, detection horizon of classic automated uh, methods for annotation. And the way to tackle these questions, the, the way that I propose uh, to tackle these questions is to give a step back and look at all of the proteins using the protein universe analogy. So if we think about all protein sequences that could be sampled by nature, there's a huge landscape of possibilities. And those that are sampled uh, that nature actually um, uses correspond to just a few points in this uh, huge landscape of possibilities. And those that are functionally annotated could be seen as bright stars in this universe, protein families as galaxies, protein superfamilies, clusters of galaxies, and so on and so forth. And then around those bright areas, you have the dark regions in protein space that either correspond to protein sequences that nature never explored, or to those proteins uh, that correspond to unknown protein families, and that probably uh, harbor some of those in the uh, dark uh, or the uh, purple bar in the plot that I showed before. So if we think about structural information, um, basically what we have in the BDB would be a representative of each of some galaxies, not all of the galaxies that uh, we know uh, what, what they do, but we have at least one representative for some of them. And then this structural information can be expanded to the rest of the galaxy and sometimes the, the super galaxy using homology modeling. And now, thanks to AlphaFold, we have predicted structures for most of the space that is represented in Uniprot. This corresponds to galaxies and clusters of galaxies that um, already have structural information in DPDB or can be attained, uh, obtained with homology modeling, but also for those that are bright, but there's no structure, experimental structure information, and 
we hope, for regions in the dark areas that we just didn't know there was a galaxy there. And so I wanted to use this analogy to um, shed light into what are these uh, hypothetical proteins that are in, in Unibrot. And our approach was as follows. So first, uh, this is a very a, quite of a busy slide, but I'll try to, to walk through. I hope I can walk you through well. I don't know if you see my, my mouse. I don't, so I will not point to things, but I'll start from the left to the right. So what we, uh, what we did was to first set up uh, a database uh, or our own um, annotated database uh, of Uniprot and Uniprot actually Uniprot and Unipark. So I took everything from Uniprot and Unipark as represented by Uniref 50 clusters. And then for each Uniref, uh, Uniref 50 cluster, I looked at how well each members of each Uniref 50 cluster was annotated with uh, domains and families as from Uniprot and Interpro, but also coiled coiled stretches and disordered stretches and basically mapped all of these into the full length of the protein, merged annotations that were overlapping and stored all of that into a database. And then looking at each individual Uniref 50 cluster, I looked at how um, what is the maximum uh, annotation or what is the best annotated member of each Uniref 50 cluster and uh, take that as the functional annotated representative. So it doesn't mean that it's necessarily the representative that it's chosen already for the Uniref 50 cluster in most cases, but um, uh, what, what I get here is that you get that protein in the unit uh, 50 cluster, so in the bucket that is best annotated, and this will be a representative of the annotation coverage, So this would be the brightest sequence in the cluster, and then the cluster is as bright as that bright uh, um, um, protein. And to compute this value of brightness, which is basically the coverage with annotations that these proteins have, um, we call it the functional brightness, but we exclude everything that has a name as domain of a non-function, so a duff or a putative or hypothetical in their title. Then uh, the idea would be having this annotated set of Uniref 50 clusters, and so pre-cluster uh, um, Uniprot, we would take this and model the protein universe landscape. And this could be done in different ways. There's different approaches to do it. And we know, for example, from DSM Atlas that what was done there was um, uh, leveraging language models and projection in 2D to get a landscape. But uh, what we did here was to uh, follow more of a classic protein evolution approach where we did an all against all um, sequence similarity, uh, um, uh, basically a all against all sequence similarity matrix that is used to construct a, a large sequence similarity network. And um, this then using this network, we could identify um, Uniref 50 clusters that are highly connected to themselves. And so they form little communities and then build a graph of communities as I will show you later. But before showing you the landscape, uh, I want to show you how this functional darkness distributes through the AlphaFold database and how much uh, of such darkness is is or is not uh, in the AlphaFold database. So starting again from the left, we start with the uh, distribution of functional brightness in the Uniref 50. So everything, uh, even things that are not in the AlphaFold database. And here, um, as of uh, August last year, uh, we get the about 34% of Uniref 50 clusters are fully dark. So it means that all of the proteins in that uh, Uniref 50 cluster are unannotated. There's no domains annotated for them, uh, no disorder, no cocoa, no anything. So they're just empty strings of amino acids. And it's quite large if you look at the bar of full functional brightness. Now, if we go into the AlphaFold database and look at those, just take only those Uniref 50 clusters where there's at least one member in the AlphaFold database, of course, you get a reduction in the number of, uh, of um, uh, Uniref 50 clusters. So there's at least 10 million um, Uniref 50 clusters that are not in the AlphaFold database. Um, and you also get a decrease in the proportion of dark in RF50 clusters. So there's already some a big amount of darkness that is uh, that is not 
in the AlphaFold database per se, because they Uniref 50, these Uniref 50 clusters are just from Unipark or they have viral proteins or they are very long proteins. Now, if we consider only those Uniref 50 clusters where the best, um, where the, uh, the entry that it's the best model in the AlphaFold database has a PLDT higher than 70%, so quite a high confidence, you only get half of the Uniref 50 clusters. So uh, all of the other things are not uh, a model at a, uh, at a relatively high accuracy. And again, you get a decrease in the uh, amount of darkness. And now if you take only those where the average PLDT of the best model protein is 90%, so really, really high predicted accuracy of the model, you're only dealing with 6 million UNIREF50 clusters. So it's about 10% of UNIREF50. And again, get a decrease in the proportion of darkness. So things that are can be modeled at a much higher predicted accuracy in the AlphaFold database are also those that are typically well characterized or can be annotated uh, automatically as an interpro. So they are mostly bright, but there's some darkness there. And so there's two messages in this slide. Uh, one is that there's a lot of darkness that is not in the AlphaFold database uh, or is out of the uh, um, scope of modeling by AlphaFold, but there's already a quite large uh, fraction of uh, dark protein. So those that are difficult to annotate that actually have now uh, good predicted uh, high accuracy structures from which we can now start to learn from these structures or try to infer something about them. So these were the ones that we looked at uh, now and we constructed the protein universe landscape using this large uh, sequence similarity network approach. And this is the network that we obtained. And uh, what you can see from this network, so it's it's six, about 6 million UNIREF50 clusters. This accounts for about 50 million uh, unique proteins in, in the AlphaFold database. And uh, you can see here on the right, uh, the network, and uh, one there's already a striking characteristic of the network, is that you have here in the middle a, what, what I call the inner blob, um, which is accounts for 50% of the UNIREF50 clusters. Um, and uh, these are all interconnected uh, communities of UNIREF 50 clusters that are very similar, or that at least have share really high uh, sequence similarity. And uh, you see here, I annotated some of what some of the regions mean. Uh, and you have oxidoreductases connected to OxA5 and to methyltransferases. And these, uh, basically, these are not supposed to be the same family or superfamily. But what this um, region here in the middle of the network uh, describes is the modularity in protein evolution. So you can have a protein with domain A and B, and then another one with B and C, and then C and D. And so these all of these start becoming connected to each other because they share some parts of them. Uh, and also what you can also see is that this um, blob here in the middle is where most of the bright dots are. So uh, you see here the bar on the bottom right. This uh, highlights what the color map of the network is. And so if you have purple, you have functionally dark um, regions. And if you have white, you have fun functionally bar uh, bright regions. And you see that there's a lot of uh, brightness here in the middle, while on the outside, so this inner reach, you have all of these little dots, uh, uh, all of these dark dots. I changed the slide by mistake. You have all of these uh, dark dots, and these basically are uh, individual clusters or connected components where everything is dark. So what I show here on the left is the distribution of darkness based on the size of the connected components that we see in the in the network. And so if you have um, components that are really, really big, they typically uh, have a much higher uh, amount of brightness. So they are much better. They have proteins that are much better annotated. Uh, and those that are much smaller are the ones where all the darkness is, but still there's a, a quite large fraction, so 19% of the connected components in the in the network uh, are fully bright. So our hypothesis or is that 
these fully bright connected components are a major source of putative new protein families. So if we zoom in into the network, this is the kind of things that we would see. So the uh, uh, here now starting again from the left, uh, if you a fully bright cluster example is cluster one, uh, which it's every all the nodes in the in the connected component are are uh, white, so everything is really well annotated. All the entries there are really well annotated, and they correspond to uh, a family of lipid carriers. Or you have an example as cluster one hundred and fifty nine. Uh, where all of the pro all of the nodes are purple, none of them is annotated for anything. Uh, and so this is actually an uncharacterized protein family. But you can also have mix. You can have things as here in the uh, in the middle where you have this mixed cluster arrow pointing up, where you start from uh, if you go from the right to the left, you see that there's bright dots becoming darker and darker. And so these are correspond to cases where, the dark, the non-annotated proteins are actually remote homologs of proteins that are better annotated. And so we could already use these links to uh, make some inference or at least try to guide the annotation of these dark proteins. But as I said, uh, the purple ones, in my case, in my interest, are the more interesting ones because these would be the ones that possibly correspond to uh, unknown protein families. And the, the example I want to show you is cluster 159. Uh, I, there's no really a reason why I chose this one. It was one of these uh, cases where you start looking, navigating through the network and just stumble up upon this cluster. And it was interesting right away. So it was one of my first encounters in, in the network and also highlights, to me, it highlighted how much hidden uh, uh, treasures were in the network already. So this cluster 159 uh, is the one I, I showed here in this, in this slide. Um, when I looked at the predicted structures, they, uh, for all the end, or for many entries from the cluster, they all looked similar to each other. So there was a common fold being predicted and structure-based searches into the PDB found no matches to, to them, to it. So I could not use structured, at least the, the structures of, of non-function to make some uh, um, prediction of what this protein could do. Uh, but then uh, I used deep, deep fry, so a structure-based uh, function prediction uh, uh, deep learning network that takes the protein structure and predicts Go terms uh, that may be associated with the function of this protein. And as a side note, it also provides uh, with which residues are contributing the most for that prediction. So although it was not trained for that, it also gives some kind of indication of what could be the region of the protein that carries out the function predicted. And for, most, for those cases, what was most common to get was a prediction for DNA binding. Here, the, the red residues are the ones contributing to that prediction and an hydrolase activity. Uh, so it's already suggested to me that maybe these proteins are somehow involved in breaking DNA or nucleic acids. So then I looked deeper into it and I constructed a higher resolution sequence similarity network for, for this protein. So took all of the homologs and did again an all against all um, a comparison and build a sequence similarity network. And what I could see was that actually cluster 159 is not a family, it's a super family uh, with at least seven different families. Here, a number from one to, to seven. And looking at the genomic context of these proteins, because all of the proteins that I collected, uh, they were homologs to, of the uh, of cluster 159, they were all from prokaryotes. So we could try to learn something from the conserved genomic context that uh, encodes for them. And what I saw from that was that uh, each individual regions of these uh, high resolution maps, so the, the clusters 1, A, B, C, and 6, had a similar uh, genomic context with another protein called uh, RELB-L, so it's actually RELB-like, uh, RELB and then cluster 2 also had this two-gene uh, 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 conserved arrangement, but with another um, uh, uh, five-prime gene Cluster three had another one still, but so still always the same two gene uh, arrangement, 
but always with a different partner. And I, when talking with colleagues in, in Tartu and in Lund, uh, I showed them this and uh, they were uh, are actually experts in toxin antitoxin systems. And they said, well, you know, this looks a lot like what we are used to work with. And this really calls toxin antitoxin system. And so they uh, did experiments to evaluate that. And that's exactly what they observed. So here, very shortly, what we see on the right are the two experiments that were carried out. So we selected six um, uh, examples from, from uh, gamma proteobacteria. Uh, and when making E. coli express only our purple one, so only the, the member from cluster 159, E. coli was not happy and was not growing. But when, when you uh, compensate and give also the um, the uh, cognate uh, partner, uh, you get that, that uh, E. coli is happy to live. So there's um, uh, the our cluster, our purple gene uh, has a toxic effect and the cognate has an antidote effect. And by doing metabolic labeling, what we could see was that uh, there's no effect on the uh, incorporation of uridine and timidine. So production of DNA and RNA is fine. But there's a reduction in the product in the incorporation of methionine, uh, so there's a decrease in the production of protein. So uh, uh, the effect uh, or the what this toxin probably targets is translation, which is also compatible with the hypothesis of nucleic acid binding and anhydrolase activity. But of course, we cannot do this for all the clusters in in the map. Uh, so what I did then, well, what we thought was, well, there's this new way of naming proteins in Uniprot, of, or at least naming hypothetical proteins in, in, in Uniprot, which is based on a language model. And we know that language models have the tendency, the tendency to hallucinate uh, answers when faced with something that they never saw before. So our hypothesis was that, well, if these, in, these clusters indeed correspond to protein families that don't look like anything that was ever annotated, probably the names that would be predicted for these clusters would be widely diverse. And uh, that's exactly what we did. So we looked at, compared the distribution of names uh, in fully dark clusters with those in fully bright, and we saw that there's much higher diversity of names given to fully dark uh, proteins. And we put a cutoff, a 20% of diversity of words, and uh, uh, together with uh, Tony and Alex uh, at the EBI and PFAM, um, that with our help now that they are curating all of these families and seeing that indeed these are new families that not even, were not even given a duff before. And so now they are all given a duff, at least they are duffs now and they're just not completely unknown. Of course, one could also ask, what about the structural level? We could also do such a clustering at the structural level. We didn't do that uh, because Martin and, and Pedro were already doing that. And uh, I uh, completely recommend you to check their, their, their web servers too, uh, of, called Alpha Fold Clusters, um, that was also published at the same time as us. What we did instead was to look at the diversity of sublocal structures of these predicted structures compared with the PDB. And uh, so if um, Tsujanani developed a score that is based on the uh, substructure composition of protein models and look at the distribution of these substructures and compare them with the PDB. And so if the distribution of substructures of a given model is similar to what we see in the PDB, they will be an inlier, so they would be found like as common in the PDB, but if they are different, they will be outliers. And so they will be something that would be either underrepresented in the PDB or something completely new. And uh, when looking at outliers and, and looking at how brightness distributes in outliers and inliers, we saw that most of the, the, the darkness is actually in the outliers. So they have predicted folds that are not so common in the PDB. And when we look at outliers, uh, there's many reasons why something can be an outlier. You can have completely repetitive and low complexity structures because of course they are harder to characterize. So you, even if you know that these pro what these proteins do and, uh, and that they are highly repetitive, their representation in the PDB is gonna be much lower than what they are in nature. So they are going to be highlighted as outliers in our map. Uh, you can also have uh, obligate oligomers 
but you can also have fragments of proteins. Uh, so this is quite useful to find fragments. But more importantly, you can also have novel folds as the speed of flower that, uh, that we discovered. Of course, we made it a web resource. Our uh, network is fairly available to, um, to the community as, as the Protein Universe Atlas. It's fully interactive and you can you can change the, the you can see dots colored based on functional brightness, but also on the counts of inner uh, so how, how many inner F50s are there, structural outlier, kingdoms, and uh, the diversity of words as predicted by language models. You can um, narrow down to, to specific intervals of, of the metrics you want so that you can only highlight those clusters you're interested in. You can query by, by cluster ID and get a full view of what the component is, but also zoom in into individual communities You where you then have information about uh, everything that is inside of that node. You can see the structure and you can also link to different databases. Um, and uh, you can also search with structure and sequence. So if you provide then uh, a structure, um, and yeah, you can also export the data as uh, any format for downstream applications, and you can upload a structure or, or a, a FASTA file. And if you do it with structure, it will uh, use the uh, FaultSeq API to search for the best hits in our network. And if you uh, uh, submit a FASTA file or sequence, you're gonna get um, it is going to just use the uh, the same um, workflow as used in Swiss model to find templates. So with this, I'm finishing. Uh, I just I hope that um, we are all convinced that we can now shed light into uncharted areas of the protein universe at, at an unprecedented scale. Actually, there's a big fraction of uh, proteins of unknown function that now have high predicted accuracy structures in the AlphaFold database that can be uh, now leveraged for for further annotation and drive experiments and the network streamlines the identification and annotation of such cases that pulling information from across the universe of uh, well i call it the universe but across the network uh, can easily prioritize uh, identifying those interesting cases uh, but also that automated annotation is a tricky task and requires a combination of methods and approaches. But still, as a community with all the developments that are happening now, we are closer than ever to explore uncharted areas of the protein universe. I want to thank you all for listening. I want to thank uh, uh, the who invited me uh, for, for giving this talk. It's a pleasure to be here and tell you about our most recent work. And I want to thank especially to the Schwede group, to, uh, to Torsten for hosting me doing this 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 work, coming up with this crazy idea and supporting me completely on doing this work. And of course, the full Schwede team for, for going with me on doing this and helping me a lot, especially Janani, Andrew, Gabriel and Gerardo. Our collaborators in the University of Tartu and Lund, uh, uh, Alex and, and Tony at PFAM at the EBI, but also Mehmet at Venta AI and Cycor and our funders, the University of Basel, the Biosentrum and SIB. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Johanna, for this excellent presentation. Um, we have time for a few questions. So if you could, the participants could use the Q&A um, box, then then I could uh, read a couple of them. But I, in the meantime, I received one from Manjit that I can I can raise. So um, is there the, the difference between different nodes in your graph, does that correlate with evolutionary origins, was his question. Um, so one of the uh, principles of, for have, for doing it this way is is actually to have some kind of evolutionary information there. Uh, I didn't look specifically at um, at the what kind of information uh, kind kind of evolutionary information is there, but this is one of the things I want to do in the future and also um, have a little bit more of because now we have meaning for edges, no, for nodes, but we don't have meaning for edges, and that's what I also want to incorporate uh, in the future, yes. Thank you. And um, while, while questions are coming in, I have uh, one question. Based on your opinion, how far do you think are we from accurate AI-based techniques or approaches for functional annotations of proteins? Uh, that's a very, very difficult uh, question. I really don't know. I think one of the, one, I remember seeing something at the ISMB that 
AI-based methods for function prediction are even the most accurate one is not that accurate. And one of the limitations for that is the lack of data. And also, I could also imagine that the fluidity of protein function um, and the, the effect of point mutations in completely altering what a protein is going to do, it's it's really going to make it hard. Um, but so I, I don't, I cannot really answer, but I think there's still a lot to go. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. And oh, there is a question. So could you somehow uh, embed the genetic context information into the graph? Well, you could, yeah, theoretically, of course you could, you could do it. So now that we have these, um, uh, we have this basic, the way I see the network we have right now is our starting point. So it's the basic point to go. And so of course you can do, you could do a network based on different uh, similarity matrix, matrix. You could do it by these proteins are close to each other in genomic context. This is one of the principles, for example, in the toxin antitoxin system field. Uh, there's a tool called NetFlux that tries to build such a network for toxin antitoxin interactions. Uh, but you could also annotate genomic context into the nodes. Uh, yes, it's just a matter of having time to do it. This is, of course, is one of the things I also would like to do, yeah. Thank you, and and I guess in the interest of time, one more question um, that came in. It's, I think it's to do with alpha-4 database and its limitation of not having viral proteins. So the question is, this, this uh, stru uh, cluster structure universe, it does not include viral proteins, is that correct? Um, it does, so it does in a sense that you uh, we included the entire neuron f50 cluster uh -huh. so if the entire neuron f50 cluster has a viral protein it's going to be there and also we also know that there are things that are tax when it comes to taxonomy especially when it comes to phages and prophages you can have a lot of proteins that are actually of viral origin annotated as coming from bacteria so we already started looking into that a bit and we found some. So it's it doesn't have viral proteins because so as alpha fold doesn't have viral proteins, we don't include those, but we include the UNIREF 50 cluster. We include them if they are in the UNIREF 50 cluster. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. And uh, the highest.